Okay, a very good afternoon and good evening to all our viewers in India, Japan, and rest of the world. My name is Deepak Mishra. I'm the director and chief executive of ICREA, Indian economic think tank based in New Delhi. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar on India-Japan partnership towards resilient supply chains. We are particularly delighted to hold today's webinar in India uh, when India and Japan are about to celebrate the 70th anniversary of establishment of diplomatic relationship between them. As many of you would know, ICREA was established with the goal of providing thought leadership to the idea of linking India to the world. And this event is a great testimony of our mission. We have been at the forefront of research and dialogue activities with regard to India and Japan relations. The Japan program in ICREA was set up in 2007, and we are hoping to enlarge this program soon by setting up a dedicated India and East Asia knowledge network. Behind today's topic, first, there is a growing recognition that the risks to global supply chains have intensified in recent years. First came the global financial crisis in 2008-9. Then we had the US-China trade conflicts since 2016, followed by the COVID pandemic in 2020, which is ongoing. And now we have the Russia-Ukraine war. These factors have shaken the confidence of investors and policymakers around the world in the resilience of supply chains. Second, and perhaps more importantly, geopolitical factors have laid some to raise uncomfortable questions about excessive reliance on one or few countries in the global supply chain, especially when it comes to countries that do not share common global values and democratic norms. This is an uncomfortable question for economists, uh, especially like as somebody like me, who tend to gloss over inconvenient political economy issues behind global supply chains. But the realization has dawned that such questions can't be ignored anymore, and which is precisely why we have brought together economists and diplomats in this panel to debate this issue. The immediate context for the webinar was the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, the so-called SCRI, SCRI, which was launched in April 2021 by India, Japan, and Australia. The focus for today's deliberation will be on economic viability of SCRI, trends and developments in the supply chain of Japan, and where does India fit into that story, and the diplomatic policies and business environment in India, uh, that India is putting in place to attract FDI and to raise the potential of its uh, trade and investment relationship with Japan. It's a real privilege to have among us Ambassador Suzuki, Japan's ambassador to India. We're extremely grateful, Ambassador Suzuki, that you accepted our invitation to deliver the keynote address. A very warm welcome to you to this webinar. It is also a great source of encouragement for us that Ambassador Verma, India's ambassador to Japan, has shared a video message for us and the participants. He was unable to join given his travel schedule, uh, but Mr. Ambassador uh, Verma has been very supportive of our India-Japan related activities. We look forward to his continued engagement with the future endeavors. So without further ado, let's start today's proceeding with Ambassador Sanjay Verma's video address. Can I request Sanjana to play that for us, please? Thank you. Distinguished panelists, distinguished participants, friends, ladies and gentlemen, Namaskar, Konnichiwa. I'm extremely honored to be a part of this informed discussion on India-Japan partnership towards resilient supply chain. We have seen in past few years the ills of over-concentration of supply chain in one geography. Embassy of India in Japan have been deeply involved in promoting 
supply chain diversification of Japanese manufacturers in India. When Japan faced an acute disruption due to supply chain over concentration in one of the geographies, it considered providing incentives, both financial and policy, for the Japanese manufacturers to diversify from the over-concentrated geographies so that disruption in one country does not impact the entire supply chain. Japanese manufacturers who have deep roots in its neighboring geographies found it very difficult to diversify or relocate and move away from their traditional bases. However, recently we have seen that some of the Japanese companies have been able to move out. They have chosen to move to Japan for domestic supply chain integration. They have also moved into their partners in Southeast Asia. And of course, some of them found their way to India. But still the numbers are quite low and we would expect that more and more Japanese companies try to look at India for possible supply chain diversification. When we look at supply chain diversification, then the first question which would come to any manufacturer who is trying to diversify it is what should be the criteria for choosing a particular geography to get its supply chain reinstalled and therefore feed into its both domestic, regional and global supply chain. Therefore, there comes the concept of supply chain integration. Uh, it's a very complex process, but at the same time, the group which is authorized and required to make the final integration needs to visualize the entire supply chain. Visualize in terms of its inputs, visualize in terms of its timeline, visualize in terms of its logistics. When one talks of supply chain diversification and move to the new geographies, one thing which is for sure is that these new geographies will never have full supply chain, or in many cases, even partial supply chains. So in that context, we need to identify what I will call as gaps. These gaps identification can only be done if an intensive uh, research and survey takes place to identify each component of the final product, its origin, its inputs, resources required. It also gives rise to two kinds of concepts when we talk of supply chain integration. One is by through the investment itself, so that the manufacturers invest into the new geographies, create capacity to manufacture, but at the same time, we'll also need to look at the trade related issues. So for example, let's consider India. So if a Japanese automotive industry, automobile manufacturer starts creating supply chain at the component levels in India, it may succeed in creating 90% of the entire supply chain in India, but still 10% would be produced elsewhere, which will be required to be brought into India for final integration. And therefore that becomes a trade related issue. Uh, uh, and Therefore, when we look at the final supply chain integration in its entirety, we'll have to consider both the investment related issues as well as trade facilitation related issues. Once we have been able to set our target on both investment largely and 
trade to some extent, there comes the issue of capacity creation. This capacity creation could be in terms of supply of inputs, logistics, human resources, technology, infrastructure, and many other conceivable elements of the possible supply chain. Once we are able to reach there, we have to have a concerted strategy through which we will be able to work together as partners and look at various kinds of investments, various kinds of trade related facilitation between our two countries. There comes another difficulty. As long as it is only for the Indian domestic market, the Japanese investments in the supply chain in India would largely be required to follow the Indian standards. But if we are also looking at exporting these components of the supply chain as products to the entire region, we'll have to consider the standards and norms which are prevalent in the region. It becomes even more complex if we look at the entire world, which means we have to follow the standards and norms which are followed uh, uh, on an average globally. So capacity building in norms, capacity building in standards also become equally important. So, ladies and gentlemen, you must have heard about an intent of investing 42 billion US dollars over the next uh, uh, five years uh, through public and private sector investments by Japan in India. These investments will come largely for the domestic market, but it will also focus itself on the supply chain integration. Now, the private sectors, the businesses of both the countries need to take advantage of this commitment between our two prime ministers. We will need to understand that cluster approaches would work the best when we talk of such integrations. Japan is very much looking forward to India for supply chain diversification. We in India are looking forward to Japanese efforts in our capacity building in order to integrate the supply chain, not only for the domestic market, but also for regional and global markets. Therefore, let's work together and enhance our existing spatial, strategic and global partnership. Take this to the next level, create and become partners in the socio-economic development of, in the most reliable manner, in the most resilient manner, in the most trusted manner. Namaskar. Thank you. Um, let me thank Ambassador Burma in his absentia for a very informative and illustrative uh, discussion about the Japan-India bilateral relationship and how this potential can be realized. Um, I wish him Godspeed, his and his colleagues, for turning many of these reality uh, commitments into reality soon. Now let me invite Ambassador Suzuki um, uh, for, uh, to deliver the keynote address. Uh, I think Ambassador Suzuki uh, no, needs no introduction uh, in the Indian context. He has been in India since the last two years. Um, uh, he had a long and distinguished career as an ambassador and as a civil servant in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan. He has experience in a wide range of areas such as national security, Agents, counter proliferation, as well as global issues such as cybersecurity, out space, and counter terrorism. Um, Ambassador Suzuki holds a master's degree from School of Advanced Studies at John Hopkins University. He joined Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1984 and has been in India since October 2019. Mr. Ambassador, it's a pleasure to have you with us. The floor is now yours. 
Uh, Deepak, they just informed me that they are trying to reconnect. I think their connections is gone. I'm sorry. Okay, so, I didn't yeah. realize that. <laughs> so they so, just called me up. So then everybody has to wait for a second. I think there was a bit of a technical glitch at Ambassador's end today. Yeah, they, they hit we, that. So I'm sure they'll fix it very quickly. So just bear with us for a few minutes, a few seconds rather, I hope. Hello, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, Ambassador. I just introduced you and left okay. the floor to you to give the speech. <laughs> I'm, I'm very sorry for this uh, repeated uh, disruption uh, due to technical issue. No, but not. thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity, uh, Dr. Mishra. Uh, His Excellency, Mr. Sanjay Kumar Baluma, Ambassador of India to Japan, Dr. Deepak Mishra, Director and uh, Chief Executive of uh, ICLIER, uh, Dr. Elisabetta Gentil, uh, Economist of Asian Development Bank, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to join you today. Uh, to deliver my message on the very important topic of uh, resilient supply chains. Um, on uh, 19th of March, Prime Minister Kishida visited uh, India and held a summit meeting with Honorable Prime Minister Modi. This was uh, Mr. Kishida's first bilateral visit outside Japan since he took office uh, last October, which is a befitting example of how highly Japan values its relations with India. At the meeting, both the leaders express their shared intention to realize a public and private investment and the financing of 5 trillion Japanese yen, which amounts to approximately uh, 3 lakh crore rupees from Japan to India in the coming five years. This came as Suzuki Motor Corporation signs an uh, MOU with the state of Gujarat on the margins of the summit uh, to invest approximately 10,000 crore rupees, around 150 billion Japanese yen uh, for manufacturing electric vehicles and uh, EV batteries in Gujarat. The joint statement released after the summit meeting includes a number of important economic takeaways, such as the progress in the uh, Mumbai Ahmedabad high-speed rate project, which is a flagship uh, bilateral cooperation project. The exchange of official notes concerning yen loan for seven projects in India, under which Japan provides over 300 billion yen, uh, over 20,000 crore rupees, of loans for various socio-economic development projects in India. The launch of the Japan-India Clean Energy Partnership towards achieving respective carbon neutrality goals, uh, the formulation of uh, the roadmap under the existing India-Japan Industrial Competitive, competitive Competitiveness uh, Partnership, uh, the launch of a new initiative uh, for the sustainable development of the northeastern region of India and the opera uh, operationalization of the specified skilled workers scheme and the starting of its uh, qualification test in India. The summit was highly successful from my standpoint and both the governments reaffirmed uh, their resolve to further advance our economic partnership. Japan and India are in a special strategic and global partnership. This is the only bilateral partnership that Japan calls special, strategic, and global. At present, economic security is emerging as uh, one of the critically important aspects of our partnership. We have experienced series of uh, disruptions in uh, global supply chains since the advent of COVID-19. Distortion was first witnessed in the supply chain of uh, medical equipment, followed by all types of containers uh, used in shipping industries and a jolting impact on the supply chain of semiconductors. At the same time, we saw rising economic tension between the US and China, whereas we are currently uh, witnessing the conflict 
and Ukraine. We cannot rely on China and Russia for the supply of rare metals or rare earths under the current situation. And we need to diversify the supply chain for critical strategic materials, as Dr. Mishra mentioned at the outset of this meeting. The currently ongoing situation is also causing um, a massive disruption of energy and food supplies across the world. In such a tumultuous situation, we must remain resilient and keep focusing on our common vision of a free and open in the Pacific, free from coercion, based on the shared values and principles that we have nurtured. Earlier this month, the cabinet of Japan uh, submitted a bill on enhancing economic security to uh, the parliament for approval. One of the key elements in this bill is to strengthen uh, the supply chains of specified materials and goods. This bill is one of the fundamental elements for the realization of a new form of capitalism that Prime Minister Kishida advocates since he took office. The bill also aims at uh, ensuring economic growth while improving the autonomy of Japan's economic uh, structure. Given the complex international circumstances as well as the magnitude of the issue, we are also aware that a single country cannot achieve economic security solely on its own. In addition to deepening bilateral cooperation, Japan and India are also collaborating as members of the Quad in this regard. Japan will be hosting the next Quad Summit meeting in the coming months. Practical cooperation in uh, contemporary fields, such as uh, critical and emerging technologies, cybersecurity, and climate change, is, climate change are good examples of uh, what the Quad framework uh, intends to offer. Let me emphasize here that uh, these measures and partnerships are not for protecting or isolating ourselves. Rather, economies in such a world would be powered by robust investment and trade flows through diversified, resilient, transparent, open, secure, and predictable global supply. A resilient supply chain is thus critical because uh, it overarches uh, the economic prosperity and uh, security of our people. Building resilient supply chains, especially using digital technology, has immense potential. Visualization, simulation, AI-led forecasting, and data-driven optimization of supply chains are prominent technologies used by industries today. The Japanese government promotes diversification of uh, trade and investment and incentivizes the enhanced utilization of digital technologies by private companies. Japan-India economic ties after World War II started with the iron ore imports from India to Japan in the 1950s. Indian iron ore accounted for 30% of Japan's iron ore import in 1960, contributing significantly to Japan's swift, swift reconstruction from the devastation of the war. Japan's very first official development assistance loan was provided to no other country but India in 1958. Later on, Suzuki Motor and Daikin expanded their businesses to India in the 1980s and the 2000s respectively, which contributed significantly to the buildup of India's manufacturing industry and its capacity by having created a network of parts and components suppliers in India. Japan and India have always achieved economic prosperity together with a strong supply chains, both domestically and internationally. This year marks uh, the 70th anniversary of the establishment of India-Japan diplomatic relations. On this auspicious occasion, 
Our Prime Minister mentioned at a business forum on the margins of uh, the summit meeting that he looks forward to opening a new chapter of our economic partnership through the cooperation between the public and uh, private sectors. Over the next five years, the two countries will work together to achieve a target of total investment of 5 trillion yen. We have successfully achieved 3.5 trillion yen investment target in the past five years. So we set an even more ambitious target this time. This new target combined with the production linked incentive, PLI schemes of the government of India will definitely help in fully realizing the Make in India initiative in the future, in the near future, and also in achieving India's $5 trillion economy by 2025. I know I'm speaking on behalf of my friends present here today and those in the government of uh, India as well, when I say it is absolutely necessary to make consistent efforts to transform India to an even more attractive and business-friendly place for Japanese investors in order to realize our shared target. So in closing, I'd say to all the participants here, Indians and Japanese alike, let us not forget to do our homework and let us join hands in our important endeavor. Thank you very much. And I wish all for the, all the success of this uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It was a very um, informative uh, and a very interesting perspective that provides us a great deal of material uh, to reflect upon during the course of this webinar. I think you uh, some of the points you made were extremely important. That the fact that Prime Minister Kasida's visit to India was the first outside the country, the fact that the relations between India and Japan is the one, uh, the only one that's called special, strategic, and global. Um, tells you the depth, breadth, and the intensity of this relationship. You also told us a lot about the, the past and the current and the future prospect that th this relationship can bring. So thank you for a wonderful and a very ex you know, optimistic and excellent speech. So now we'll move on to the rest of the seminar. So a very uh, big thank you for giving us the keynote address. Now let me turn to Dr. Elizabeth Denton, who is an economist at the Asia Development Bank and the co-editor of the Value Chain Development Report 2021. Dr. Gentle has a PhD and an MA in economics from University of Houston, Texas. Today, she will be presenting some of the findings from the Global Value Chain Report to set the context for the rest of the discussion. Elizabeth, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Deepak. I would like you to please confirm that you can already see my presentation on your screen. Yes, I can. Wonderful. Very so good. I'm going to time myself. And first and foremost, I would like to thank eCareer for this opportunity to contribute to this very, very important discussion. And I am very grateful also for the contributions by Ambassador Verma and Ambassador Suzuki, who actually already discussed the details of the India Japan partnership. So what I can do now is take a step back and talk about the broader global setting uh, or what's going on, what are the key findings on global value chains from this presentation, uh, this report that we have published uh, just at the end of last year. So let me begin by showing you a very important graph, which is GDC participation rates for the whole world uh, from 1995 to 2020. And as you can see, the two lines represent two different methodologies that we have used to calculate uh, GDC participation. One is trade-based and the one in blue, and it's uh, preferred by the World Bank. And the second one in red is uh, 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 production-based, which is pre uh, preferred by our partners at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the technical details. Just, I just want to show you that the trends are very similar and what they are telling us is something very, very clear. We had growing GDC participation until 
the global financial crisis in 28, when, uh, 2008. As you can see, there was then a big dip in uh, GDC participation. Then we entered into a period that we call globalization, where there was so much progress in terms of GDC integration at the global level. And then the dip that you see beginning in 2018 is the trade dispute between the United States and the People's Republic of China with all the uncertainty that brought on the global scenario. So if you break down GVC participation by country, and again, as you can see on the left, we have the trade-based measure and on the right, you can see the production-based me uh, measure. Uh, and we, uh, we have ranked them in both cases by GVC participation. The first thing you notice is that between 2000 and 2019, pretty much every, almost every one of these economies uh, increased its GDC participation. So the, if you focus on the dark blue dot and then the red blue dot, you can see that for almost every economy, the red dot representing 2019 is ahead of the dark blue dot. What else can we see from this graph? Well. That both the United States and the People's Republic of China are top layer, but interestingly, they both have below average GDC participation. You can also see that the People's Republic of China actually decreased its GDC participation between 20, 2000 and 2019, whereas for all European, almost all European countries, it, they became more integrated between in this time period. So one of the important focuses of this report is looking at what conventional trade statistics are missing about global value chains and how can we introduce new measures, improved measures that can help us understand uh, what's going on uh, with global value chains. So this is an example. Uh, when we look at GDC participation uh, with a specific focus of, of what multinational corporations are doing. And as you can see, we have three different measures here. We have a trade-related uh, measure of global value chains activities, which is trade in intermediate by domestic firms. We also have, and that's, that's the dark blue that you see in the, in the, in the figure. Then we have the light blue, uh, which is, uh, sorry, the gray, that is FDI-related GVCs. And that's the sales of local affiliates of multinational corporations. And finally, we had trade and FDI related, which is all other trade and intermediate. Well, the gray area, which is FDI related GDC activities, is completely missed in star than the composition. But this is very important because it's actually showing us that the local sales by multinational corporations are, for all intents and purposes, GDC activities but it's not, it's missed, it's not measured by conventional statistics. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's as important as the other two components put together. So this is very important for us to consider. So for example, GDC participation with multinational corporations uh, was 20.2% in 2016 as a percentage of the world economy, of the world GDP. So that's, that's pretty remarkable. Well, it's needless to say that uh, the, the United States continue to be at the center of global demand uh, uh, of, for GVCs. So from a demand perspective, the, U the United States are still at the center. Between 2005 and 2016, nothing much has changed. What that means for us is that what happens in the United States basically matters to the rest of the world. So policy choices made in the United States have an impact on the rest of the world. So it's important. another element that we tend to miss uh, when the conventional statistics tend to miss is that there is a new trade model that has emerged in the last, in the last couple of decades where firms export the service of their intangible assets through tangible pro uh, products that are manufactured, manufactured by foreign contract uh, uh, manufacturers. This is different from trading intangible goods, is different from trading services because 
the intangible goods themselves do not cross the border. They are embedded in the exports of the tangible goods that they are. So this is what we call trading factor income. And what I want to show you is that when you look at this new measure, trading factor income, which is the red one, you can see how the, the US exports to the People's Republic of China are substantially higher than what conventional trade statistics are able to capture. Whereas the exports to the US from the PRC are substantially lower than what is captured by conventional trade statistics. What that implies is that the trade deficit, uh, uh, the so-called trade deficit, so the trade surplus between the PRC and the US is uh, uh, overestimated by conventional trade statistics. By looking at trading factor income, this trade surplus is uh, uh, remarkably reduced. Now, what that, why does that matter? Because uh, success in global value chains begins with us being able to accurately measure what is going on so that we can actual, actually understand what is going on in global value chains. Another element that I want to show you is when we focus on, not on global value chain, but what we call manufacturing GVC income, which is the activities carried out in a specific economy for final manufactured products produced anywhere in the world. This is different from manufacturing output or manufacturing GDP because it involves all the activities that lead to the production of a manufacturing product anywhere in the world. So when we break down this GDP income into two components, the scale of participation, that is how many workers in a specific uh, uh, region or country are participating uh, uh, in, this in these activities, and instead the productivity of these activities, and we look at developing Asia, we find some very interesting findings. We find that the scale uh, of production activities, the scale of, of workers working on global value chains in developing Asia, you can see India is the fourth economy from the top, uh, is pretty much the reason has been driving the convergence of income uh, of global value chain income in the region. Whereas productivity, yes, it has increased between 2000 and 2018, but it was starting from a relatively low level. So the productivity convergence process is still underway. So basically what we get from this analysis is that participation of, a, of uh, Asian workers in uh, activities uh, along the manufacturing GVCs is what is really driving uh, you know, income convergence in the region. Productivity convergence is ongoing, but it's starting from a, from a lower level and it's a very slow process. Then another important element has emerged from the GVC development report 2021. As you know, a lot of emphasis has been placed on upgrading along global value chains. There is pressure on uh, developing economies that join global value chains to upgrade from uh, relatively lower value added activities, like such as assembly and, 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 you know, and fabrication activities to higher value added activities that can be either pre-production or post-production tasks. So what we are showing on the, in this graph, so if you look at the linear path, in, for example, in a high-tech industry, such as electronics, you know, tablets, and mobile phones, a linear upgrading pattern would be from assembly of electronics to standard module manufacturing, so to manufacturing the various modules that make the electronic uh, uh, item, to core module manufacturing, to starting some R&D activities all the way up to module-based product design and brand marketing. However, uh, some manufacturers, especially in the People's Republic of China, in the example that we show in the report are Oppo or uh, uh, Huawei, uh, they managed to go from assembly directly to module-based product design and brand marketing. So how did they do this? 
simply they did not try to manufacture uh, the modules that make the electronic output. They just bought them from foreign uh, suppliers, such as, such as in Korea or in Taiwan, uh, and then focused directly on building a brand and building an awareness of their product and, the, and uh, with marketing-based strategies, differentiating their product from the foreign competition. And that has worked very well. So this means that precisely the modularization uh, of manufacturing production allows a different type of a trading, which is no longer linear, but it is non-linear. That is jumping directly from assembly to higher end post-production activity. It is important though, not to neglect the important role of global services value chains uh, in, in development. Uh, we, here we have two wonderful cases. On the left-hand side, we have the Philippines, and on the right-hand side, we have India. Now, for the Philippines, uh, the business process outsourcing BPO industry and their, and their active participation in this industry shows a boost in employment from 2005 to 2018 and a boost in revenue from 2004 to 2018 that is absolutely remarkable. On the right hand side, we have another brilliant example of successful integration in services in value chains from India, which has been able to deeply integrate into the value chains of the global software industry, resulting again in remarkable growth in employment and revenue in the ICT industry. Now, there have been concerns about service led development. There have been fears of premature the industrialization that have been expressed. But uh, according to us, they are unwarranted because many services share similar characteristics to manufacturing industries. For example, economies of scale or positive knowledge spillover. The advantages of services GVCs is that they have been proven time and time again to improve gender equality. Uh, uh, services liberalization is estimated to account for almost 10%, for example, of the decline in, Indian, uh, in India's gender education gap. It's also substantially greener than manufacturing. But the challenges are that services GDPs are still intensive and might actually widen inequality in the population. Also, they are highly concentrated in urban areas and so, again, might widen urban-rural divides. And finally, when you are talking about the low skill uh, end of the services spectrum, they are very much threatened by automation. So these workers are um, you know, um, at risk of uh, losing their jobs to automation. Now, the last part of this talk is about the rising risk to global value chains. Uh, there are three categories, geopolitical tensions, environmental shocks, and global pandemics. Needless to say, the geopolitical shocks have become a primary concern for the future of global value chains in recent years. Uh, we have calculated the, the uncertainty triggered by the US PRC tensions added 20% to global uncertainty since 2016, not to mention the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has resulted in slowing economic activity and rising prices. Uh, it, Environmental shocks affect GDCs on both the supply and the demand side. They are typically highly localized in domestic networks and are temporarily confined. However, they are projected to increase pretty much globally. Developing Asia is very much at risk of this, uh, and they are likely to grow substantially. And let's talk about quickly pandemic shocks. Uh, Needless to say, the lockdowns and border closures restrict the mobility of labor. They disrupt the operation of value chains. Uh, there is a contagion effect that spreads uh, via, via value, value chains globally. And again, this uncertainty undermines investment. Uh, you know, global FDI fell 42% in 2020 as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Complex and lengthier GDCs with concentrated production or distribution have been unsurprisingly the most vulnerable. And you know there have been a loss of 12.6% 12, 12 of global GDP as of uh, mid-November 2021. 
However, it's important to mention the GDCs have been surprisingly resilient in adjusting to food, pharmaceutical, and medical equipment shortages. Uh, finally, digital platform. Uh, needless to say that the new digital economy, which has been actually accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic, is built on platform. And network effects make, is what make platforms available and uh, valuable uh, to more users. But this is unequal. As you can see from this graph, the platform economy is skewed towards Asia, North America, and Europe. So digital platforms have created internet-driven value chains. Uh, this has led, of course, to a diminished importance of brick and mortar stores. Uh, and of course, again, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated uh, this trend, especially with small and medium enterprises, which have gone uh, belly up because of the inactivity. The, the advantage is that they make participation easier and reduce transaction costs. They lower the cost of participating in international markets. They, they have more benefits beyond sales, like digital payments, final services, etc. There is increasing inclusivity for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, but the challenge is that we need to regulate the monopolistic power of digital platforms, and this is a very challenging task. With this, I complete my presentation. My apologies for going slightly over time, and I'm looking forward to a very stimulating discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was wonderful. It's a very rich and informative presentation. And I think especially the fact that you mentioned about the move from linear value chains to non-linear ones, the emphasis on services, and the digital value chains are super important. And one would hope that there are good reasons to believe that the next phase of this global value towards digital and services would work well for India, which has competitive advantages in this area. But you also talked a lot of the risks to the global value chains, which is the reason why we have the seminar and that provides a lot of food for thought about how do you strengthen the supply chain resilience between India and Japan. So to discuss that, we have four panelists today with us. Um, I'll introduce them briefly um, as and when they, uh, I invite them to speak. I'm hoping that we'll, I was hoping we'll have two questions for each, but I don't think we'll have time to put us one, but let's see. Um, but I request all of them to you know, speak to three to four minutes maximum for, question, for each question so that we might try to get a second round. Let me begin by inviting Professor Kimura, um, who is a professor in economics in Keio University, Tokyo, and chief economist of ERIA, which is the Economic Research Institute for Asian and East Asia, based in Jakarta. He received uh, his Bachelor of Laws from the University of Tokyo in 1982, and MS and PhD Department of Economics, University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1990-91. Um, you can find his detailed resume on a website now, let me begin by asking you, Professor Kimura, that increasingly multilateral initiatives um, on supply chain resilience have strong geopolitical overtones, that is repositioning key strategic supply chains to countries with similar shared interests and values. In your writing, you have suggested that such trends are not economically viable. Has US-China trade friction, COVID-19 pandemic, Russia-Ukraine conflict changed your view? If not, why not? So how do you see the global value chain's uh, future in the coming years? Over to you, Professor Kimura. Thank you very much. A big question. So in three, four minutes, so how to answer that. But uh, yeah, so we have a lot of uh, discussion on uh, economic statecraft or economic uh, security now. And uh, we, we are introducing uh, export control and other measures. Uh, we have pressure, we have, we have a sort of pressure coming from both uh, the US and China on uh, so-called decoupling. And then uh, some decoupling is going on, but they still are part of uh, our economy. So something related to sensitive technologies, uh, semiconductors are a bit larger one, but uh, other uh, industries are using uh, uh, rare earth and also uh, 
something related to human rights. So, so we have to do those kind of things. I cannot, I'm not a political scientist, so, so we should do uh, to some extent. Uh, but, but if you look at the private sector, the community relationship is going on pretty much very strongly. If you, even if uh, the US firms are having a very close economic relationship with China too. So, so the important thing is that uh, how to set up the boundary of uh, decoupling. So, so and the rest should be under the rule-based trading regime. I, I think that's very important. So in order to support a sort of WTO initiative uh, or regional trade agreements like a CPTPP or a RCEP, uh, in order to set up a sort of rule-based trading regime portion. So some part we have to do some sort of uh, uh, economic security, export control issues, but some part, but the rest should be under uh, rule-based trading regime. From the viewpoint of the third countries like ASEAN and India, uh, th th this could be a sort of opportunity for take advantage of uh, uh, trade, possible trade or investment diversion. So, so don't, don't be shy to take advantage of that, uh, to get uh, the economic activities. I think that's very important. So uh, Russia-Ukraine war, it's going on. Uh, you would say conflict, not war. Okay, that's fine. But uh, we watch carefully. And uh, so we have a lot of uh, news uh, bro broadcasting, uh, the, the stance of India and other things, but uh, I don't talk about that. But uh, so in the economy side, Certainly, we would have repercussions in energy and food. So, so we have to watch carefully on that. So I, I have a relatively optimistic probably so far that uh, we would have a global value chain still, uh, but uh, some part is going to be much more controlled, uh, managed trade. So we cannot avoid that, uh, but trying to try to contain the part of our, our control trade portion and the rest should be under the rule-based trading regime. Uh, that's uh, what uh, probably we should do that. Uh, the, uh, lastly, very briefly, um, the impact of COVID-19 was uh, very interesting, uh, particularly in the case of a core part of uh, global value chains in East Asia, machinery in international production networks, that they were very robust and resilient actually. So uh, the shock, negative shock was uh, just temporary and then the recovery was very quick. Uh, actually, we had a positive demand shocks over there too. So, uh, so, my, so production networks are, were working as a sort of built-in stabilizer, rather plus uh, aspect rather than negative aspects in East Asia. So, so I think East Asia is uh, still having a sort of confidence that uh, globalization forces can be utilized uh, for uh, economic economic development. Th that could be a little bit different from other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Kimura. Can I just ask you a follow-up question quickly? Um, you know, the IMF is coming up with some new work post-COVID where they actually find that um, the, the intra-trade between East Asia um, has been very good, even the period that bounced very, very quickly, as you said. In fact, any trade that went to East Asia or any supply chain that went to East Asia has been very resilient. Um, whereas the uh, value chains between Latin America and North America or between Europe and North America have actually broken down. Right. So the trade hasn't grown so fast. Right. So the fact that the value chains are very resilient, Elizabeth mentioned this, is it because of uh, the resiliency of the countries, which is the East Asia, or is it the resiliency of the supply chain themselves? Where do you think strength of this global value chain lies? Yeah, I think the most important thing is that uh, sophisticated value chains are resilient because I know that to set up a sort of really stable, uh, uh, predictable and also reliable networks, we have to invest on that. Uh, so the East Asia did that. So that's why those are, are resilient. And then certainly another element is that uh, what sort of products are going, going there. Uh, so those are uh, basically uh, uh, general machinery, electric machinery. Uh, those are having a sort of positive demand shocks coming from COVID-19 because uh, we, we have to work at home and other things. So, so maybe both elements are coming in over there. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Kimura. Now let me turn to uh, Dr. Badri Nara and Gopala Krishnan.
um, who is the lead advisor at Niti Ayo, Government of India, where he heads the vertical of trade and commerce. Dr. Badri has also been a senior economist and affiliate professor with the University of Washington, Seattle, senior fellow at the European Center for International Quality Economy, Brussels, and has worked at NCAER and CSEP in India. Uh, so question for you, Dr. Badri. The general impression is that India, India and Japan bilateral economic relations has underperformed. In fact, we had a seminar about a week ago where one of the Japanese professor looked at and gave us very strong evidence as to how much India-Japan economic relations have actually underperformed compared to say, Japan with the rest of Asian countries. Um, so do you agree with that proposition? And if so, could you tell us what has led to this underperformance and what we can do to achieve the world performance, especially from the Indian side? Over to you, Dr. Bhatri. Thank you very much, Dr. Mishra. And I also uh, thank the, the uh, Honorable Ambassadors and uh, Dr. Jinkel for the wonderful presentation and to my fellow panelists for the great discussions. Um, this, uh, this is a great question. And I think to begin with, I would like to say that uh, in, in, in absolute terms, the cooperation between India and Japan has been very fruitful. There have been a lot of uh, collaborations. And if you take from India's point of view, uh, uh, Japan has been one of the closest uh, allies when it comes to economic cooperation, trade, and so on. So, so I think that I wanted to make that point clear. And of course, your question is different. Your question is about how uh, India-Japan uh, economic cooperation has performed when you compare with the Jap Japan's economic cooperation with the other uh, East Asian countries. So there, I, I may have to partly agree, uh, although I, I haven't personally done any detailed uh, research on it, but based on what I've heard and what I've uh, seen, uh, uh, I think that, that that might very well be true, um, and 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 I think when you uh, there, there could be different reasons for that. Uh, some of them uh, could be uh, specific to the nature of uh, uh, you know cooperation between the two countries. What what India needs, what what Japan needs, you know what what do they need from each other, and how how much are they open uh, to providing what they what each of them needs from the other. So, so that is one thing. The second thing could be what is kind of generic, what India offers to all countries in general and, and, and even to the domestic players and, and, and vice versa. So I wanted to you know, divide these two, two, two different uh, broad categories. And in the first category, I would say that uh, I could actually, when I thought about this, uh, this kind of aspects, um, I could not find any uh, major uh, hurdle which is Japan specific for India or India specific for Japan uh, that is causing this uh, difficulty. Um, or, or I wouldn't say this difficulty, but lack of achieving the potential. Um, so uh, I, I can give a lot of examples, but in the, in the interest of time, I won't go into the, 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 the very many examples where we have we have done really well, but rather I'll directly come to the the, the, the points of the, the potential uh, issues. Um, so I think one uh, issue would be that the um, uh, in, in, if you take this uh, supply chain resilience initiative uh, and and the joint statement. If you look at the India Japan joint statement, uh, the word resilience comes uh, as many as five times. When you compare that with growth, it comes only two times. So resilience is very important. So when it comes to resilience, uh, I think the, the the extent to which uh, the other East and Southeast Asian countries go to um, uh, to to basically. Um, uh, with, with in terms of reforms and bringing the investments, welcoming the investments there uh, has been, uh, I would say, similar to what we have been doing in India. But uh, with some of the uh, ongoing efforts that we are doing, like uh, the ambassador rightly pointed about, uh, pointed out about the PLI scheme, for example, 
uh, some of these schemes. I think in the future we can see similar kind of uh, attraction that can happen. Uh, so I think we have been lagging behind in the past in in some of those kind of uh, incentives, uh, you know, uh, incentives to attract investment. And this is not it's not necessarily uh, uh, only with respect to Japan, but in general. And now that in the last few years we have doing, we have been doing well on on attracting investments, making India as a, as, a, as an important investment destination. I think this can uh, this can be uh, uh, this can be a, a great uh, game changer. So uh, so several uh, reforms happen in the recent past in India, like uh, GST, corporate tax rates reduction, uh, ease of doing business, you know, improvement, and all these things. So. And 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 also even uh, revamping the labor laws in some states. So these are these have uh, been increasing the positive sentiment between India and Japan. But again, if you look at the past, if you look at the last few years, I mean last two decades, three decades, uh, then the, this these things would would, would appear like um, an, an important impediment. Um, and and also another thing I would say when you, when you trade. As an example, if you look at the SIPA, um, the, the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement between the two countries, uh, then I think um, one um, limitation of uh, many of these trade agreements that we sign is that the industry also has to take the agreement forward, the, the provisions in the agreement forward. So, in many cases, the, uh, uh, in some of my past research before joining the government, I have seen that the utilization of Preferences uh, has not been very high, not only with respect to India but many other developing countries. So I think that is another aspect. So we have, have all this SIPA and other cooperation that are happening at the government level, but industry level uh, there has to be more uh, proactive uh, involvement. Uh, they have to utilize the preferential, the preferential treatment more, um, and, uh, and also the. Um, uh, the, the when when you when you think about the the, the infrastructural aspects, so we we have uh, we have been doing a lot of uh, headway, making a lot of headway in terms of uh, improving infrastructure, but uh, but there is also a long way to go, and that again is another uh, factor that has been an impediment in the past, and that is also a, a, not only it is not not only an impediment, but it is also an opportunity area of an opportunity for. Uh, Indo-Japan collaborations, and there have been many good examples like the metro system where uh, Japan has contributed in the past. Um, and I think these are these are some uh, uh, some aspects. But I I, uh, I I definitely think there are uh, more than so more than saying that these are the concerns. These are the and would say that these are all areas of opportunities where uh, Japan can step in and India and Japan can collaborate. Uh, infrastructure is a big area, and, uh, and also we at Nitya we are very also very grateful to Jika uh, for the uh, generous uh, donation for Aspiration Districts, the whole Aspiration Districts program, which is a great success in development. Uh, that has been uh, thanks to the funding from aid from Japan. So many of these things are are happening, and I think. Um, in, in this process of uh, deepening economic cooperation, development cooperation, uh, we can also address the, the the structural issues that have been uh, acting as an impediment, and and I think uh, that that is probably the way to do. So rather than putting it uh, totally in a bad or negative light, I would say that these are I would, I would look at these as areas of opportunity, where again Japan can play an important role, and probably India also can play a Proactive role to to gain uh, mutually from the relationships and in the process remove these impediments which are not specific to Japan but to many other countries. So I I will uh, keep my response short in the interest of time. So thank you, Dr. Badri. That was very good. I think you basically made us two very important point. One is to uh, look at the glasses half full and as an opportunity. Uh, rather than as um, half empty. I think the second point I think you mentioned, which is that I think there's a lot of reform that has happened in the last few years, and hopefully the future would be much more brighter, and a lot of this relationship uh, would get strengthened 
uh, economic ties between two countries because of that. So that's wonderful. I'll come back to you. There's a loaded question for you in the chat box if you want to take a look at it. Um, uh, but it's for general panel, but I thought you might like to answer it. Uh, but in the meantime, let me turn to uh, the next speaker for the evening. I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Noriyoshi Fukuoka. Mr. Noriyoshi is the Director of Southeast Asia Office of the Trade Policy Bureau, Minister of Economy. Um, lost my screen. Um, um, just a second. Um, is, he's the director of the Southeast Asia Policy uh, of the Trade Policy Bureau in the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, METI, Japan. Mr. Uh, Noriyoshi has been with the METI since 2007, holding various important positions. He has a master's degree in international and development economics from Yale University and Bachelor of Engineering from University of Tokyo. I think the most important thing for me is uh, Ms. Noriyoshi was part of the delegation that uh, uh, when the Prime Minister of Japan visited us a few weeks ago, he was part of it. So I would like to share, you know, request him to share some of his broad observations if he wants to about the visit, anything that he found useful, interesting to share with us. But more specifically, I wanted to ask him a question which is regarding the influence of geopolitical factors um, versus the economic issues. So in, I think uh, this goes to the heart of some of the things that we're debating today, that on one sense, um, you know, from a pure economic uh, issues, you know, having a supply chain between two countries makes, you know, not a lot of sense. It should be global. We should be doing it with, a, with wherever the lowest cost production happens. But from a geopolitical sense, there's a lot of reasons to do it. So from Japanese government perspective, how does this politics and economics intertwine? And how is this going to shape the future of global supply chains and the future of the supply chains between India and Japan? So over to you, Mr. Noriyoshi. Hey, thank you for a kind introduction. Uh, I'm a director of the Southwest Asia Office of METI. And uh, this is a very difficult question to answer uh, with uh, three minutes, but and, uh, politics and economic, economics originally cannot be separated completely. And I would like to share with you a hint from a paper I wrote last year as a consulting fellow of the Research Institute of Economic Trade and Industry. Let's move to the page 10. And uh, before, uh, uh, the paper describes the diversification of non-economic values in the supply chain management. Right, let's move to the page 10. <laughs> uh, before the current situation in Ukraine and Russia, there has been a growing trend in the supply chain to focus on non-economic values involving their uh, geopolitical factor and uh, environmental factor and uh, uh, human rights factor also. And as a trend to consider geopolitical, environmental, and human rights values in the supply chain management is rapidly increasing. Uh, in other words, the relationship between politics and uh, economics become closer than before. Uh, let's move to the page 10, 10 please. And the, uh, uh, the short answer for the initial question is that uh, we have to find a uh, balanced path between politics and economics. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Short, I hope it was no, not because no. we could. Okay, can you, would you like to continue uh, Mr. Noriyoshi or? Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Okay. No, I um, no. So I think I think you you gave uh, an answer in a very diplomatic way, which is that obviously we need to look at both, and I think that's very important. But the question is, is um, you know, if we uh, and as you heard, uh, you know, Professor, um, uh, that we had in the beginning, uh, Kimura mentioned that. 
you know, at the end of the day, the value chain is very much an economic concept. And so obviously there's a lot more weight on the economic issues. There could be some deviation because of political reasons. But I was wondering if you have to think about, let's say economics and politics had certain influence uh, on the value chains in the past, going forward from the Japanese perspective, is politics going to take a much more important role or do you think it will remain the same as before? Narayoshi? Sorry? Yeah, I was, I was asking you, do you think is political factors going to become more important in the future yeah, or yeah. they are going to remain the same as before? Yes, I think so. And uh, uh, in my presentation materials, the number of the uh, importance of the non-economic values is uh, rapidly increasing now in recent years. Uh, involving the environmental value and the customer value and the human rights value and their uh, uh, geopolitical value. Okay, we that's... counted we okay. counted the uh, number of the papers uh, treating with uh, non-economic uh, values in recent years. Okay, thank you. I think we'll we'll all read the paper with a lot of interest. I think it's very interesting that you're saying. Uh, based on the paper publication that uh, environmental values or human rights values or geopolitical values are going to play increasingly bigger role or larger role in shaping the global value chains. Uh, okay, so that, that makes this uh, event even more important. So now let me turn to uh, Ms. Mona Kandahar. Uh, Ms. Mona is the Minister of Economic and Commercial in the Embassy of India in Tokyo. Um, she's a member of Indian Administrative Service 1996 batch and the topper among the women candidates in her batch. Um, Ms. Mona has studied her undergraduate in financial accounting, economics, and computer programming for University of Mumbai. She was clearly ahead of time picking up the right subject when she was a student. She's a Mason Fellow and MP in International Economics from Harvard Kennedy School, Boston. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Mona, question for you is what has been the fact that you are the Minister for Economic and Commercial Attaching in, in Tokyo, um, what do you see as the response of the Japanese companies with regard to India as a destination for manufacturing production, besides the whole trend of relocating from China? So we heard that there is um, market forces as well as other factors, including government support from the government of Japan to move companies uh, or relocate companies from China as part of the diversification strategy. So where does India fit into the story? Are we seeing a lot of companies coming in? Uh, if so, why? If they're not coming, why are they not? So we'd like to hear from you. Over to you, Ms. Mona. So thank you very much for that kind introduction. Can you put up, uh, can my slide be put up on the screen? Um, my presentation can be shared on the screen. Yes, Ms. Mona, we're just putting it on. Okay, so I'm, in the interest of time, I'll continue to give my response. So I'll pick up the thread from uh, Ambassador Suzuki's address, uh, mentioning announcement of uh, Japanese investment of 5 trillion uh, Japanese yen in India over next five years in the recently held India-Japan summit. So, uh, and another important thread is that uh, supply chain resilience initiative is critical and strategic. Uh, it is necessary for critical and strategic sector. Can you go to the main slide, please? So here, I just you know, want to show that uh, uh, the announcement of 5 trillion Japanese yen uh, investment includes both official development assistance and uh, that is which comes from government and um, FDI, which comes from private sector. So the data that I'm sharing, you can see that um, uh, though the cumulative FDI from 2000 to 2021 is, is uh, more than USD uh, 35 billion from Japan and among top five, Japan is among top five investors in India. However, if we look at uh, the global investment made by Japan, uh, the share of uh, Japanese investment coming to India 
hovers around 1.2 percent. And uh, 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 if we see the trend of FDI in the recent years, especially after SCRI initiative has been announced, it was first announced on 1st September of 2020. Uh, uh, the FDI in 2021 was even lower, about 106 billion Japanese yen, though it has picked up uh, recently, but still it hasn't reached pre-COVID level. So this is, um, th there is an impact of COVID-19, but at the same time, we have to uh, remember that during the same year of 2020-21, India saw a record uh, FDI investment in India, total overall FDI, uh, to the tune of uh, USD 82 billion. But despite of that, <clears throat> the contribution of Japan was around 105 billion Japanese yen. So uh, even after announcement of uh, SCRI initiative, the Japanese FDI hasn't picked up uh, to what, you know, what we have anticipated. And uh, uh, the response of Japanese companies to the PLI programs you know, um, uh, announced in about 14 sector by government of India is yet to be explored and optimized. So uh, now let me also know, briefly mention uh, the government side or uh, official development assistance that is coming from government of Japan. So here we see that um, it is like um, India is the one of the highest recipient of Japanese official development assistance. And it is about 20.5% uh, of total such assistance provided by Japan uh, globally. So this uh, point that I'm trying to make is that this G2G chemistry needs to trickle down to business to business. And a lot of efforts are required from both the countries to bring businesses together. Now, um, you mentioned about China. We know that Japan, even before all this uh, geopolitical and economic uh, uh, challenges and complexities that have emerged recently, Japan has been following the policy of China plus one. However, the focus was more on um, ASEAN countries rather than India. So now uh, with SCRI initiative focus is also on India. And in um, um, after COVID-19 pandemic, government of Japan announced a very important program or rather Japan is the only country who has announced such program to support or to provide financial assistance to Japanese companies who would like to diversify mainly to Japan and also to other countries. So with other countries, initially it was mainly ASEAN countries, but after our discussion and all, uh, India was also included. And two Japanese companies under this program came to India, which is Toyota Susho under Rare Earth and Sumida under auto sector. However, if we see uh, the <clears throat> sectoral aspect of it, uh, the presence of Japanese companies in India is highly concentrated in two or three sectors, mainly auto sector. So here also that diversification is necessary. So therefore, a lot of efforts need to be made to bring the private sector of both the countries together. Now, uh, if we see the case of China, it is uh, uh, a little bit opposite. There we see a lot of B2B connect uh, between Japanese companies and Chinese companies, uh, though um, may not be, I mean, ODA to uh, Japanese ODA going to China is not uh, comparable to what is coming to India, but a lot of B2B connect. And we just can't compare the number of companies, Japanese companies present in India and in China or in ASEAN. So this is the point that I'm trying to make and to reach to the um, investment or Japanese investment of 5 trillion Japanese yen in next five years, a lot of efforts needs, needs to be made here to promote uh, Japanese companies coming to India because all this additional investment need to come from private sector. The ODA part has reached a saturation. So um, this is briefly what I would like to mention in response to your question. Uh, Ms. Mona, that's a very important point you are making that 
while the G2G is actually doing well and perhaps even reach saturation, I think the B2B is the one which is underperforming. And especially if you compare it with China, we are nowhere there. I think this graph uh, table is very revealing that 25% of the ODA from Japan comes to India, whereas only 1% of the outward FTI from Japan comes to India. So if there's an underperformance, it's certainly on the business side. And I think that's where the real investment has to happen. So because all of you have been so disciplined with time, I think we have uh, scope to go through another round in a very short, uh, quick way. And I think that this particular question that is coming up on the private sector, Professor, I'll pick on that and ask you, and starting with Professor Kimura, that um, when it comes to Japanese private sector and their diversification strategy, do you see them to kind of branch out of China into ASEAN and to eventually to India? Um, or do you think they're going to do a lot more reshoring? Uh, because we know that the now technology is allowing them to do that. Uh, so where do you see the private sector moving in the next few years? Um, yeah, yeah. one thing is the China element, right? So, uh, so certainly many Japanese companies are uh, uh, having a sort of a sense of uh, risk in China, but uh, still at the same time, China is a very important business partner for them uh, as a production site and also as a market too. So, so, uh, so, so looking at the risks, uh, still uh, many companies would like to keep uh, some operation in China too. Uh, but at the same time, uh, particularly the industries uh, with the sensitive technologies and rare earth and other things, and also something related to uh, environmental issues uh, or human rights, uh, they, um, they would have uh, more concern on a kind of a possible uh, backlash in uh, uh, in operating uh, in China too. So, so many companies are certainly think of uh, sort of a, a diversification of the location. Uh, re reshoring is a pretty limited so far. Um, I, I think uh, uh, certainly we had some re reshoring clearly in uh, fa face masks and other things, but, but uh, overall, I think uh, quantitatively, uh, those are very small. Uh, so Japan is having a sort of labor shortage too. So, so I think it's not a really, really big, big issue. So, um, so that's quite different from EU. If you look, look at the EU, uh, so certainly with uh, geopolitical tension, they are really, uh, uh, having a sort of reshoring inside, coming into a sort of EU, within EU now. So, so I think uh, the trend is uh, quite different in East Asia and also Japan. So we would have more diversification. India should be a good, good destination, certainly. So still, uh, many companies are con have some concern on investment climate over there, including, say, physical infrastructure and other things. So, so but uh, this is a good chance for India to attract more investment, definitely. Yeah, that's uh, good to end on that positive note. I think there is hope and there's more diversification where India should be a beneficiary, but we need to do a lot more. I think India has been doing, but I think it's from a low base and there's a lot more to be done in the future. Uh, Dr. Badri has been obviously kindly re responding to some of the questions that was coming on chat box, but for the benefit of the um, audience, let me repeat the question that we have just got. And I think uh, it is about this, the SCREE initiative that was announced. Um, so there's a suggestion as to how about expanding that um, uh, because the U.S. is now talking about launching Indo-Pacific economic framework. We don't know a lot about it, uh, but uh, something will happen soon. So in that context, what are the obstacles that India is likely to um, expect, or you know, how is India going to respond to extending the membership of SCRI to include ASEAN countries as well as the United States? Dr. Bhatri? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mishra. Uh, thanks for the question, Professor Shinova. Uh, yes, as I mentioned in my uh, chat, I think, um, personally speaking, it's a, it's a great uh, proposal. And in principle, definitely it's great because we are, broadly speaking, we are all uh, uh, similar kind of, uh, we, we have similar kind of uh, institutions, politics and uh, economics are uh, positive there. The, the, there are a lot of uh, broad complementarities. 
uh, but of course uh, there could be some difficulties and impediments when we get into the details uh, in terms of you know the detail and practical aspects like uh, uh, economic complementarities to what extent you know if you take india and japan there are a lot of complementarities because there are uh, we are kind of like uh, uh, you know we, we, we say in the fairy tales like made for each other kind of thing there's so much complementarity but if you look at uh, some of the, the uh, developing countries in ASEAN and in India, we, in, in many aspects, we have uh, a lot of competition. We have similar, uh, you know, competitive advantage in, in many aspects, uh, similar factor endowments. Uh, so I think uh, that that could be one uh, difficulty. And, uh, and there are also some geopolitical sensitivities, which, uh, which all of us know, with some, with some of the ASEAN members in India, there are there are some geopolitical sensitivities and lack of. Uh, there could be some difficulties in terms of compatibility and so on. And there is also domestic sensibilities uh, that 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 can involve the the. I mean, this is kind of similar to the the, the economic complementarity question, where uh, industries that are similar in both countries uh, that there could be some sensibilities involved in uh, different countries in ASEAN and India. So I think these these are the details that have to be worked out. I'm not I'm not uh, saying in a negative sense that it's not at all possible. I'm saying that maybe this, the reason why this hasn't happened so far, despite being a great idea principle, could be some of these. But uh, but all these could be worked out. It could be dialogue, debate, discussion, and uh, could be worked out. Like this the U.S. initiative of Indo Indo Pacific Economic Forum could probably lead to such a such a thing because a trans-pacific partnership uh, a while ago was basically uh, started with this kind of a, an, an initiative and intention uh, uh, so so it's and then it, it, it did succeed to a large extent uh, so i think something along those lines could be uh, could, could be explored so so i'm i'm, I'm saying that this is uh, definitely a wonderful uh, thought process and great idea but the details have to be worked out. Thank you. Since we have... can, I, can I make a comment on this, Kuli? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Ms. Noriyoshi, I was coming to you. Great. Please come in. Yes, yes, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to make a comment on the screen because uh, I'm in charge of the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative in the Ministry of the Economy, Trade, and Industry, Japan. And uh, first of all, the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, Kuli, is a uh, India, Japan, and Australia initiative. And we would like to focus on achieving results in the three countries first. And specifically, first point is to implement joint projects in collaboration among the three countries. And the other point is to develop the discussion on supply chain resilience principles. Uh, in this regard, we believe that the cooperation with ASEAN and the US is important. JETLO and maybe held the Supply Chain Residence Forum and ASEAN Secretariat and ASEAN Business Organization and the Think Tank and the US companies participated in this forum. Through these measures, we would like to promote discussions on the resilience of supply chains in the region, regionally. Thank you so much. Okay, so that's also good to know. Thanks for clarifying that, uh, uh, Ms. Noriyoshi. Um, since we are already answering some of the questions in the chat box, I am expecting that we don't have to really go back uh, for a um, for a QA. and a If you have any question, do put it on the chat box. Um, now, can I turn to, um, actually, uh, Mr. Noresh, since you have the mic, uh, can you also tell us a little bit more about uh, the, the question that uh, Ms. Mona posed, which is the fact that the business to business is underperforming. And since you have the year to the ground and you were in the Prime Minister delegation, what are the your you know things that the Japanese companies have concerns about uh, for not investing more in India? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for uh, your comment. And the Japanese government launched the support program on diversification of uh, manufacturing base of Japan, Japanese companies to Asia uh, as a 
Barma Sand, Mona Sand, many people mentioned before. And we are also supporting the shift to digitalization of supply chain. And these Japanese policy measures and India's PLIs are program and the scheme will help to support invest investment in India by Japanese company. I think to that, it is very important to improve the business uh, environment, business climate, and uh, business uh, uh, such as uh, logistics or uh, uh, transparency of the taxation or so that kind of other business environment improvement improvement of business environment is very important and this will uh, also contribute to the make in india thank you okay thank you now um last but not the least let me turn to uh, miss mona um i think um you made some very important observation, but I wanted to come back to the same question that was asked to some other panelists, including Dr. Badri, which is that, do you think it would be a good idea to initiate an India-Japan ASEAN dialogue on supply chain resilience, uh, given that India has opted out of uh, RCEP? Um, what is your view on that matter? And what do you think the government of India might be considering on this, this particular issue? Yeah, so, um, uh... Actually, India enjoys good relations with both ASEAN countries and Japan. In fact, um, ASEAN and Japan were uh, um, the first among the first ones with whom India entered into you know, free trade agreement and um, IJSEPA uh, kind of framework. And uh, you no, know, uh, at that time we had Act East policy. So even other countries in the vicinity, like South Korea, so we entered into FTA with all these countries. However, uh, the experience of India uh, with this initial FTAs had not been very encouraging. It was mainly because of two things, and uh, these two things also affected you no know, India's uh, affected India's decision to finally withdraw from RCEP. Number one was uh, circumvention of rule of origin. So um, India, uh, India was a victim of uh, you know, the circumvention of rule of origin. And as a result, uh, uh, goods getting dumping into India's market. And as a result, you know, we have a, 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 our trade deficit ballooned and we, were, uh, we had that challenge of uh, you know, how to uh, control that. So that, that is India's uh, one of the biggest control, um, uh, concern. And um, India repeatedly uh, put forth a point that uh, we should have a foolproof uh, framework to ensure that uh, rules of origin are not circumvented. So that is a uh, number one concern of India. And second was um, uh, multi multilateral trade or bilateral trade in services. So we have, I mean, though these frameworks include uh, you no know, trade in goods, trade in service and investment and everything, but it is highly, you no know, uh, highly uh, um, tilted towards uh, uh, trade in goods and not uh, in trade in services. So India wanted this balance. Uh, uh, then only it can be like fair and uh, balance for India, but that also couldn't come through. So as a result, you know, India has uh, now requested that all these early FTAs, they need to be reviewed because not only these issues, but things have changed a lot. So uh, if a review takes place, that may open up the possibility of uh, you know, all these uh, 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 equations or revised equations and other things. So what is important is to review this uh, uh, initial free trade agreement and IJSEPA, and uh, uh, that our government has already conveyed uh, this to our partners with whom we entered into a free trade agreement and uh, comprehensive economic partnership agreement um, uh, initially. So uh, if that if that can uh, happen, then I think uh, uh, a door will be open and also bilateral economic cooperation in place, especially B2B part. And for B2B part, you no know, government of Japan is announcing uh, financial support under SCRI. We also have a program like PLI. We also have Gati Shakti. 
Um, our, our private sector has shown strength in startup and innovation. So we have foundation, but it is important how we bring all these blocks together so that we can support because uh, see, we are seeing that SCRI is talked about uh, very often by the government. Governments are very keen, but not, um, I mean, private sector, though they might be keen, they are not able to implement because it involves investment. And uh, I mean, it, these are not easy kind of uh, decisions. So here we see how politics and economics, you know, they tend to differ and uh, this kind of decision makings differ. That's why we need to provide them more support if we want to see really the diversification of supply chain taking place in, um, in a time frame. So but this is uh, two points that I would like to make. Thank you, Ms. Mona, that was wonderful. Um, I think uh, now we'll try to conclude, even if we had said 4.30, we had put it as a kind of longer term, um, a bit longish time zone, but we can finish it sooner. So let me try to conclude because I think we've answered most of the questions that came on the chat box. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to, uh, the, to ambassadors and our four panelists for providing such informative, intelligent and incisive discussion. I think we learned a lot today. I, I don't have the ability to summarize the rich discussion, but I just want to leave you with four messages. I think the first is the fact that India and Japan economic partnership is strong, strategic, and is resilient. I think that was very clear from uh, all the speakers. I think um, while it is uh, going strong, uh, the part that needs the real um, uh, examination and focus and attention is the business to business. Uh, whereas the government to government is actually flourishing well. I think there's a lot more needs to be done on that side. Um, the third message is I think the glass is half empty or half full. I think optimistically you should look at it as half full. There's a lot that's happening on both sides, uh, you know, the different programs, the incentives, the effort that's underway. And we hope that all these things will translate into a lot more positive gains in the future. And finally, I think there's a lot of promise in the future. Um, first is that diversification is going to expand, which means India will have a bigger role to play when it comes to Japanese outward investment. I think the second point is the fact that uh, the SCRI itself could expand and you know, kind of create more opportunities for India. Um, and I think there is also, um, uh, there are also potentially bigger role that uh, uh, India could play given uh, you know, the political stability, the key reforms that are underway, which often comes up with a lag. So I think there's a lot of reasons to be cheerful about, but it's, it is the gains are not neither assured nor automatic, and we have to work very hard to realize those gains. So with that, let me now turn to Sanjana for the vote of thanks. Thank you so much, Deepak. Um, really yes it's very it's my pleasant uh, task to say thank you of course first and foremost to all the panelists uh, for joining this uh, webinar uh, it is the speakers who steer the conversation and uh, i think we will all agree that we have a very very enriching uh, session today also of course a, a heartfelt thank you to all the attendees who've logged in and who who've been very actively participating in the discussion through the chat box. So thank you so much. We're also very grateful to the Embassy of Japan in India for including this event as part of their uh, celebrations to mark 70 years of diplomatic relations between India and Japan. And uh, last, and but of course not the least, we're also extremely grateful to the Toshiba International Foundation who have uh, for, so, for many years now been supporting the research and dialogue activities relating to India and Japan at ICREA. So thank you TIFO for uh, being a generous uh, funder for all these activities. So with that, I'd say once again, thank you all very much. And we look forward to have you all join us back for another session soon. Thank you.